Hey everyone, Vancouver Radio, episode number no idea. Doing this advanced, who who cares anyway? I know you don't care. So today, uh, one of my favourite topics. You know, we've talked about sleep before. We've talked about talked about bleh, we've talked about sleep in many contexts in the past, and I want to talk to someone today who works primarily in just sleep. Yeah, that's that's all this guy does. He just looks at sleep. He looks at the athletic population. Works an awful lot in pro sport. Um, huge pedigree behind him in terms of what he does. So we're going to delve into the science of sleep a little bit today. Uh, Nick Little Hales, hello. Hello, Ben. How are you? <laughs> I'm very well, sir. Very well. Um, Nick, are you well slept today? Uh, I'm actually not, Ben. You look oh. well slept, but uh, I, I'm now a grandfather of four. Oh. Um, and two of those came this year, so... Um, I'm being a little bit sort of looking after young children again uh, at my age in sleep. So last night was a little bit rocky because I was doing a bit of babysitting. <laughs> uh, when I talk about sleep online, there's always a couple of parents that will always be, yeah, yeah, Ben, wait till you have kids. And that seems to yeah, be yeah. the one variable that just screws everything up with sleep. Yeah. Well, it does. But, you know, in, in sport, the area I work in, uh, you do get parents and there are children around in any sport. So you do have to try and find techniques and flexible routines that will adapt and change to anybody's lifestyle, whether you're parents with normal occupations or even in elite sport where there's two Olympic athletes who are partners and, and have got children. The recent one would have been um, Jessica Reynolds. Mm. So before we go into anything specific, I want to give people a bit of background. Um, you're going to be speaking to a group of people that are kind of a mix between personal trainers and nutrition geeks. This will be roughly like the 190th episode that we've done on this podcast. So we are wow. talking to some seasoned individuals here. Let me give you the chance to give some background on your story. Who is Nick Little Hells? How did he get into sleep? Tell me about the journey and how all this evolved for you. Um... It's, it all started a little bit by accident, to be honest, then. Um, I was stuck in the sleep industry. I was an international sales and marketing director of a big company called Slumberland. Uh, we made sleeping products, and we did a lot of research, clinical research, into sleep to relate it all back to the types of products that, that people should be sleeping with. Um, it was a big group. We had international licensees all over the world. So principally, I was able to wander around under the tab of a director of a big company and experience how people were sleeping all over the world, how they were approaching it. And pretty much, you know, I rolled into my 40s. There was a lot of acquisitions going on around the group. And I just had that sort of, I don't know, bit life crisis moment, sat in my office in Oldham in Manchester and just thought, well, there, must be, there must be some people out there who, who understand the importance of sleep as a mental and physical recovery factor and they must be doing something with it and my local football club was Oldham Athletic they had quite a strong relationship with Manchester United I had a little bit of a tenuous link through some sponsorship I'd done with the local football club so I actually one morning something landed on my desk it came from some PR company who was talking about Manchester United and that just simply spurred me to write a letter not send a text then Write a letter in those days in the in the in the late nineties. Uh, yours, you know, dear Alex Ferguson. Yours faithfully, Nick Littlehouse. Um And I simply just asked him, "You must be doing something in this area." The he asked the staff. Um, they said they did nothing. He wrote back to me and said, "We do nothing, but the physio has been intrigued." And that was a gentleman called Dave Fever. He's still in the industry now. He works at Blackburn Rovers, a very high regard physio of the time. Um, but there were no sports science guys around. <laughs> there were no um, recovery words really being used. Um, so it was pretty, pretty simple stuff. And I literally got involved with Dave, the physio, principally about a physical problem with one of their players, which for some of your older listeners, a, a guy called Gary Pallister, who was their centre-back, he had chronic lower back issues, 
and they were wrapping him in cotton wool um, and investing quite a lot of money trying to get him from from games. He wasn't training, he could only play. And they became intrigued that maybe what he was sleeping on, the actual mattress and pillows and things, could actually be, and this was a word was made up at the time, debilitating, not rehabilitating. And so I just was asked to go and check his products, because that's really what my competence was at that time, designing products. And like every other person on the popular in the on the planet, they go out into bed shops and they get sold an orthopedic type chiropractic, nice rock hard bed, uh, which is completely counterproductive for sleeping. And so we we changed the product to something that was more designed to his particular profile. And while you can't solve lower back issues, uh, they even try to avoid surgery at all costs. Um, we actually reduced uh, the symptoms down. So he was able to do a little bit of training. He was able to recover better. And so there was a performance criteria that was born right there and then, simply from a physical sleep perspective, that all the hours that that player was using to sleep, he wasn't getting any recovery physically. So we could actually improve that player by what we did. And that inspired Dave. In that conversation and that process with that player, obviously I was, you know, just throwing out all of my knowledge to him about sleep and this and everything else, and my take on things, and he, well, he just became intrigued. And from that particular point, really principally driven by himself and the open doors that the then Alex Ferguson would have to things like this, that if it was logical, if it was practical, if it was achievable. And if it made sense, why aren't we doing something about it? And so I was asked to just simply go in one afternoon to the players' lounge. All the players were invited, just simply invited, not told to, because this was really new. I mean, who wants to talk to a sleep guy? Um, and so I went to the players' lounge one afternoon, and the only person who came up to see me was Ryan Giggs. And we had a little chat. He was very intrigued about anything that would keep his career going or ensure that his recovery as he got older was more specific than just running around and playing like kids with no fear. And from that particular point, um, a few other players started to get intrigued. And as I was driving into the Manchester United training ground in Carrington in Manchester, which is a bit of a weird setup, fantastic facility, but you sort of come at it down an industrial lane to a little barrier, and there's all the media trying to take pictures of anybody going in and out of uh, the training centre. And so the guys on reception, just another half a mile down the road, uh, would be asked by the media all the time, who was that? Who was coming into the club? And because it was not significant at all, I'm not a player, I'm not a manager, I'm nobody. And all they said, it's some guy talking to the players about sleep. So the media just went, coach, sleep, Manchester United's got a sleep coach. And that is simply how the title became about. <laughs> Nothing more than that. I was simply given the title of Manchester United Sleep Coach at that time. And they made that up. And all they wrote about at the time, which, which still makes me giggle today, and it shows you just how far this has come, then, is that it was, is this guy tucking them in into bed and reading them bedtime stories? <laughs> Does he provide them with little comfort blankets and teddy bears, these pampered millionaire footballers? Whatever next. And... So it was a very strange that on the one hand you had somebody like Alex Ferguson, like Manchester United, sort of starting to engage in an area where, you know, it was almost laughable, um, particularly with young male athletes. Uh, there were, I, I can't even think there were any women's football teams around at those times. They certainly were. We weren't aware of them if they were. And there was one or two other, there was a, Sam Allardyce was another manager in, in football that was really trying to find all of these other areas that they could use for performance. And 
it was a combination, and he had a pretty rocky road trying to convince others that all of this sort of sports science that was coming through analytics would actually make a difference. But there was a, a particular point along that route when, you know, certainly the Manchester United fans, I'm an Aston Villa fan, so I'm hurting like mad at the moment. <laughs> um, but the Manchester United fans will remember there was one particular time where they changed their kit to a grey. It was an away kit, and it was the Cantona years. And they played, and they realised that the players started to lose their colleagues because they couldn't see them within the crowd colours. And that, that was part of the whole process of looking at peripheral vision, looking at yoga, looking at Pilates, looking at strength and conditioning, and really starting to open those doors up as how they could improve athletes through nutrition, through what routines they had. And, and around that time, although Dave Fever had moved on, um, there was a new physio in called Rob, Rob Swire, who I got to know very well, who's retired now. But he also picked up on this. And Manchester United decided for the first time pre-season to double up training. So they would train in the morning and the afternoon. And so what we did is we applied this sort of sleep recovery thought process to that new thing that they were doing. And so we created a room in the training centre where we put some products. We didn't go mood lighting and candles and noise. We just put some relaxation products and, and encouraged the players that in between training sessions, morning and afternoon, they could go there and actually try to sleep. Now that, in sort of 97, 98, was just unheard of. Mm -hmm. Nobody was going near it. And some of the players, I mean, you are talking, you know, the class of... 82, you know, it was the Beckhams, the Nevilles, yeah, the uh, time. And, and Ryan Giggs. And those guys, you know, they were Alex's kids. And so they would go into the room, they'd listen to me and Rob telling them. We were pretty naive in our communications because, you know, we were just passing on knowledge. It wasn't structured. And so it, it's really around that time. And because a lot of the players were involved, you know, uh, with the England squad, um, the 98 World Cup was in France. They were staged at a northern, uh, you know, classic country club place of place. But because some of the players went to the England squad and walked into this beautiful country club in France, but they had blankets and scratchy pillows and the mattresses were rock hard, made of foam. And some of the players just went, this isn't good enough. Not because we want... Egyptian cotton and everything pampered, is actually, this is not good enough to sleep with because we've been learning about this. And Gary Lewitt, the physio at the time, who was also split between Arsenal then, um, was, was asked the question. And there was a, a guy who looked after all the sponsorship, a guy called Andy Oldmo for the, for the FA. And between them, they, they sort of said, you need to speak to this guy who comes to the club. So I got a phone call. It ended up with me sending a transit van over to France with pillows and duvets in it to try and make it better. From that point, Gary Lewin said, you need to come and talk to us at Arsenal. Um, so Arsene Wenger signed off that I could sit, I could present to the whole first team, Arsenal squad, in a conference style with a bunch of lads and talk about sleep. And it was that point where I had to structure something. I had to put all my knowledge and that brief experience in sport and put something together so I could actually communicate to Thierry Henry and Cesc Fabregas and Adi Bayor, young lads who could sleep on a, you know, sleep anywhere, anytime, never even thought about it. And it was from that particular point, uh, a few things have happened, which has been significant. Um, and running into today's world right now, it's, it's really interesting that back then, um, I was walking around pretty much being laughed at. Um, there was a few people who were interested, but uh, we had no wearables. You know, I, I, I'd only just got a mobile phone then. You, know? you tend to sort of lose sight of the fact that, you know, for most people, it was very much the mid-90s late 90s, before you started to sort of see a, 
even a computer on your desk, or never mind a, a mobile or a phone, it, like it was. So it's, it's been an enormous shift since that time, but it was a, a really strange time that I felt like I was on some sort of mission that was going to go nowhere. <laughs> but I'm still here 16 years later. <laughs> It's, it's amazing hearing you talk about it because I have, these days I have zero interest in football. Absolutely none. I'm a rugby player and that's my kind of sport. Yeah, yeah. When I was growing up, I was well into football, mainly because of probably that Alex Ferguson era of Beckham, yeah, yeah. Giggs. You know, it was a fascinating time for football. Yeah. So to hear you speak about it is kind of amazing. Um, so I'm assuming that once you went through the Arsenal process, there was kind of it was a bit of a snowball effect for you and every, all the teams started to say, well, hang on a second, there's, there's something here. Did it kind of escalate from that well, point? Well, escalate, snowball's a bit of a, an exaggeration. I think um, what certainly did happen is um, we've got this recovery room in, uh, in, Manchester, uh, in Carrington, Manchester United. Obviously, people were very focused on Manchester United, like you just pointed out. And... More to do with, well, if they're doing it, what are they doing? We need to find out. So I had many conversations with people, but all they were doing was trying to find out. Uh, they had no budgets for sleep. <laughs> it doesn't figure in everything they've got, from a medical budget to a player's budget. So there's no budget for sleep. So they literally were, were always trying to feed off what I knew, what I was doing, but very few invested in it. Um, but Gary Lewin was... Um, a real key player in those early stages because he, he really believed in there was something in this arena. And I got involved with the England squad in Euro 2004. And that was another big key point because I literally went out. It was a unique situation where the England squad would be staying in one hotel principally for the whole tournament in Lisbon in Portugal. And so rather than traveling around a lot, they, they would have one base, and that meant they could impact on them. So what they decided to do was to, to basically, I would go in to the hotel and literally set it up for recovery, rather than just going in there and saying, you know, we've paid for the rooms, so that means we get the shower, the beds, the, you know, the air con. No, 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 we've paid to stay there. Now we're going to impact on it and make sure it's set up right. And they were doing all sorts of random things like putting in 20-foot trees around the swimming pool area to stop the paparazzi taking pictures. They were bringing in gaming machines. They are bringing in their own chefs. But the one thing they couldn't get their head around was that I went in and went through all the rooms and we went, right, Beckham will have that one. <laughs> you know, Lampard will have that one. Da, 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 da. Because we've got some profiling from Gary the physio who works with the players and the clubs. And we, we sort of know about physical shape, where they've got certain allergies. Some of, you know, one or two of them had sort of mild asthma and things, some more susceptible to temperature. And we just went through this hotel and, you know, the sun comes up. So the rooms are going to get really hot on this side and then it goes down that side. So it's going to be cooler. So how do they use the air con? How do they close the curtains, open the curtains? And I literally contain it out to that hotel, um, mattress toppers, pillows and duvets for every single player, which were installed in the rooms. The other products were taken away and put in storage. So they were actually sleeping with things that were designed for you know, an elite athlete, let's say, as a football player for England, not just sleeping with what was made available by a hotel designed for anybody who comes near it. And that was quite a significant point because nobody had ever, ever, ever considered at any level in the world of football or sport to actually go in and make that environment a good sleeping recovery environment for an athlete. And so that particular point was quite significant. Um, and that really sort of, as I started to develop... The, the conversation with athletes, communicating this stuff. The one thing that we, you know, the first thing you do and a lot of things if you want to change it is we threw away the word sleep, you know, because it, it's just associated with something that we take for granted. 
You know, we can do it anywhere, anytime. It doesn't matter. Who cares whether we sleep well or not? We still get on with our lives and do what we do. So forget that. Let's talk about mental and physical recovery periods. This is what you're doing. You're recovering mentally and physically. Now, you want to be able to do that as well as you possibly can, wherever you are, wherever you're performing. And it just so happens that it's not a roller coaster ride. It's not. But obviously, the conversations start to get a little bit more serious. A lot of changes in, in the world with technology advancements, uh, the tech around us, uh, our 24-7 culture, our seven days a week working practices, the media and sports have just gone through the roof. So schedules, the ability to fly anywhere cheaply. I mean, all of these factors really started to come in, not only with the athletes, but also with their own personal lives and families and friends. It's happening to them as well. And it was almost like in that period of one decade from the sort of mid-90s to the sort of mid-2526 is such a, an enormous shift. It's almost like that whole thing had just whizzed past us as human beings, and suddenly we're starting to do things which we might have been getting away with it a little bit in the mid-90s with our approach to sleep. But then suddenly, we're not getting away with it because we started to see some of the real counterproductive uh, um, well-being side effects of approaching this in a really sort of, you know, undefined, random way. And that pretty much, I sort of collided with British Cycling and they had been challenged with trying to get all the bikes out of the sheds, get people riding on the roads as a health thing, get the bus lanes out, get Boris's bikes out in London. Let's make it a big, you know, community, national basis, health and well-being thing. And what we need is we need a great cycling squad. So get the best people, readdress what you're doing, and see if we can put people on, on podiums and win gold medals. And, and that was when I was, again, sort of given the nudge to speak to um, the then Dave Brailsford. And that particular process was always, you know, it's, it's common knowledge now to a lot of people, but it was a, the aggregation of marginal gains. You, know, you add up all of these little factors, and they will aggregate together to make an overall better performance. And so why I was sleep. And... They checked out everybody around the world, the universities, the, the clinical professors, the science guys and everything, and, and couldn't find something that was actually practical and achievable for the writers. So I got involved with that, and that really helped redefine my techniques. It helped me work with some, some athletes where recovery is, is probably at the highest with grand tours, and things like that. So there's always drugs in the background, so you know, natural performance enhancers are key. And clean riders was one of the briefs, you know, they didn't want anybody. And I spent and I still work with them now, but from around 2008 9, I worked with them, and that eventually, you know, put you know Bradley Wiggins on the podium of the Tour de France as the first British rider. And through that process. You know, I was able to explore things that that you could never have done before. And one of those things uh, then was we would profile the individual rider. We would make sure that in their own homes, that their environment was right, that they weren't doing things counterproductive to mental and physical recovery. We, I put products in there which, like mattress layers and the right linen for breathability, for non-allergens and all this sort of stuff. We, we created that product, but we created it in layers so we could actually take the whole thing as a single unit and put it in a bag, and put it in a bag and take it on a grand tour. So an individual rider, instead of staying in for three weeks on a Giro d'Italia or a Tour de France, um, for three weeks they're on the road, they're in a different hotel every night, and we're putting that elite rider into that room for eight, eight hours recovery to go do it all again, another 200K tomorrow. And 
So it just seemed ridiculous that nobody was doing it. So that's what we did. And we created, I had to design sleep kits. We designed, I've got one right here, by, next to me in the office, that the staff could put on their backs like backpacks, go into the room, literally unzip it, bang, and you've got a full bed that the rider was totally familiar with because they've got one at home. And they know that they get the best mental and physical recovery from it. It doesn't mean it guarantees it will happen because that's not the way it works. But they know that under, under normal circumstances, they will get the best recovery. And literally, they get up, we zip it back up, out it goes, into a van, onto the next hotel. And whereas you would have loved to sort of measure, you know, through some wearable technology, if their sleep quality was improved by doing it, we didn't have to do anything like that because the riders just said, this is fantastic. Because while they're riding along in the pelotons for hours and hours, they know that when they get off the bikes at the end of that day and they get their massage, they get fueled up, they have their team meeting, that they will go to the room and in that room is their sleep kit. It smells like their sleep kit. It is their sleep kit. They will get into it, they will recover and they'll be ready to go the following day. And you can imagine that sort of 2011-12 <laughs> was a because that was also the birth of the Sky Professional Cycling Team, which was managed by Richard Cycling. And so a lot of the focus was on them because they had the money. Um, so the, the whole Sky Team on the, on the Grand Tours, there was, a, there was a little transit van with a couple of guys with the sleep kits going in and out of the rooms. And you, so there was also this, what on earth are they doing? Um, that must be bonkers, but... You know, the riders realized that it was a fantastic, you know, practical achievement in intervention. We started putting high particle filters in the room to drag all the, the muck out of the room so they can breathe much better. We would cleanse the room. Uh, we would back the carpets. We would use the kits. So we were, we were giving the rider every opportunity to, to recover in an unfamiliar environment. And that, I suppose... Literally, it's a long answer to a good question, Ben, but that, <laughs> you, it's a roller coaster, but over a particular period of time. You know, around 2012, London Olympics, we, had, we went through that whole process with all the track, track and road riders for Team GB, and the Paralympic riders, male and female, the whole lot, and sleep kits, because it's part of the process, were fully involved. So they would they, they had them all in their hands. They were all profiled to every rider. But, you know, a lot, of, a lot of riders have similar profiles, so it's not one bespoke one for everybody. But there was a bespoke attitude towards it. They were all taken down to Celtic Manor prior to the games, training camp. They then went into the village. So most of them were not sleeping on the products in the village. They were sleeping on their kits on the floor, including Chris Hoy. <laughs> and, and Bradley Wiggins became Tour de France. Podium yellow jersey, and we and they won a load more gold medals, broke even more world records, and so that particular point in 2012 really put a statement that and and so Dave Brailsford was talking a lot about sleep and, and it's an an uncovered area, and if you just stop thinking about it as you sort of close your eyes and then wake up a few hours later and move on, is what's actually happening while you're sleeping? How can you try and make it work for you? And whether you sleep for, for an hour or two hours or eight hours, can you do it efficiently? And I think that started to, to really open up the conversations with a lot more people. And, uh, you know, that's moved on to, you know, over the last two years, there are devices, apps, all sorts of things going around for us to be able to measure and monitor sleep which has a plus and a negative side to it. Um, and we also have another area of, just because it's a long story then, but, you know, we were getting away with it back in the early 90s. If you just look around what we've got today, and I've just done quite a, a long uh, a project with the RFU and RFL, Rugby's your um, 
And literally, that wasn't about if it is a performance criteria in one sense. This is about recovery is more essential than it ever has been. Because what you see in, in areas like the RFL, with rugby league in this country, and you know, the associated leagues, the NRL in Australia, and we get a little bit with the NFL, uh, which is similar. It's all about the impact's gone up in the hits and the tackles. We've got much bigger guys with uh, much stronger guys. The nature of the game, the nature of everything else that goes on with, and what they see through all of their player welfare areas is that the levels of depression, stress, anxiety, physical issues, relationship breakdowns with families, with, with clubs, is that there's a lot of red flags within a player welfare. So I was actually asked to go in and do all 16 Super League clubs in two months and go to every single club and talk to every single first team player about sleep. Simply to stop them overstimulating, getting addicted to a lot of oral things that they take, including sleeping tablets, and using those things to cope with the sport. And those things become a sort of cocktail of disaster in, in, in sports and performance and in daily life. And so I think where it sits today, yet the phone is ringing on a daily basis. There's people all over the world in any sport from BMX riders to footballers to rowers to archers just because of mental concentration when you let it go. And, and in some cases, it's trying to find the edge. Some cases, it's just being able to cope. I look at some, I've just done some work with Yorkshire County Cricket Club, who are at the top of their game in cricket terms. And a lot of their players are involved with England cricket. And when you look at the England cricket schedules, when you look at Yorkshire County Cricket Club's schedules, with, you know, the changes in their sports, from the types of games that they're playing, for, you know, at all different times. Their schedules are just off the charts. And so you have to do something about it. You just can't keep pushing, 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 pushing. And I will shut up now, Ben, but even yesterday, I was having a conversation being interviewed about the swimming schedules for Rio Olympics where they are getting up and training, like swimmers always love to get up in the morning at the crack of dawn. So they're up at four or five o'clock in the morning training. They've got heat late morning, and then the finals are not until 10 o'clock at night <laughs> because of TV and everything else. Mm. And you just go, how's that, how's that person going to cope with that level of schedule? And so I think what people need to understand now is it's, it's not about just getting a good night's sleep. That is just, forget that. What you've got to look at is redefining your approach to it. Um, so you can't change what's around you. The tech, the routines, the schedules, we want to push it, we want to do as much as we possibly can. And I think our ultimate goal is to, is to sort of, why sleep at all? If we could find a recovery technique physically and a recovery technique mentally that we could do in 20 minutes, it will do it um, because it releases more of our life. And so we're not going to stop pushing the boundaries. We're not going to stop enjoying what tech can do for us and what changing our routines and changing our diets and nutrition, our equipment is going to do. We ain't going to stop that. So you've got to find a way of how do you approach getting recovery into your everyday routine that is flexible, practical, achievable, and gives you the ultimate confidence that you're doing as much as you possibly can to ensure this process is going on. And that's why the phones are going. Nick, you've uh, some f absolutely fascinating stories there. And I, I don't think I've any had anyone on the podcast that's name-dropped so much as well. <laughs> I, I don't mean to be. It's just... It's just it's just you know those those are my clients I'm afraid but I, you know no. I also went I, Nick, if I could name drop like that I would. <laughs> well, one of one of my most interesting clients because you get asked to go off you know because you know what people do in sport as you know Ben filters down you know we didn't drink water out of bottles and two liters of it a day until the sports people decided to up their hydration so. 
it always filters down. So I do get asked to go into, you know, law firms, you know, the corporate side and to educate, you know, staff within big companies and also a school, a little deprived area of Sheffield, uh, Watercliffe Meadow Primary School. I got asked by the teacher who's a big cycling fan, rides his bike in and out every day. And he's watching the kids standing outside the gates. And he knows that their parents are all working and everything else. And he sees the kids falling asleep in the class. He sees them drinking the monster and eating the crisps. And he's also got the teachers who are the same thing. And all the pressures of the educational process that's changed. Everybody's aware of that. The pressures on teachers. It's certainly not, you know, a six-month job and then six months off. With the kids, the pressure's on them all the way through. They've stopped doing outside exercise, you know, so the little playing field doesn't exist. <laughs> They've got a little concrete area to run about it. And he asked me to go in and educate the, the teachers so they could educate through whatever they're doing, a camouflage way to help the children, and hopefully then pass that on to the parents. Because type 2 diabetes, through the roof. Weight control, obesity, through the roof. Mm. The various broadband of mental mental issues are just through the roof. Ben. And, and so even in that area, you can actually, you know, name dropping, Watercliffe Meadows School in Sheffield at the forefront of looking after the education of their children. <laughs> but that's amazing because that's where the real impact happens. And I think, I don't know, you haven't quite explained it in maybe the way that I want to get to with my next question in that if you've got someone that doesn't understand the importance of sleep and I say this because an awful lot of coaches will be listening to this chat yeah. which will then try they'll go and try and teach other people when yeah. you meet resistance with sleep so if you went into Manchester United and they said well how sleep really going to benefit us I grab six hours it will do how do you try and contextualise the importance of it and how it changes someone's life? Wow. Um, I don't want to sound vague, but it's, it's very, it's quite a unique conversation to who you're faced with and, and what type of sport as well you might be facing. But I think, you know, I've, I've come across, and I still do today, uh, that I don't need any help with sleep. I sleep really well. And, uh, you know, don't need to invest anything in it. And with that type of person or that organization, if you say that if I sleep every seven-day period, my target is 35 cycles. Now, if my schedule releases 28 cycles, I'm happy. If it releases 26, I'm not happy, and I need to change that, that whole schedule. I need to look at what's happening. Because that... 35 cycle, release 52.7 hours a week. That gives me, you know, just sort of 3,000 a year. I don't want to be any less. I don't want to be any more. I don't want to sleep too much because I don't want to waste valuable time sleeping. Why would I want to waste valuable time sleeping? I want to do it efficiently, effectively, and get the best thing. And if I can get eight hours sleep from a 90-minute cycle, one 90-minute cycle, if I can get the benefits of eight hours sleep, I want it. And if when you look at how many hours do you then sleep a week? And they will look at you and they will go, I try to get about eight. Mm. How many did you get last night? Uh, about six to seven. How many did you get last Wednesday? I don't know. There's no, suddenly they start to really, you know, and just ask them, you know, how many times did you wake up last night? Oh, a couple of times just to go to the toilet. Why? Why? Sleep is all about rhythms and patterns and harmony. Now, when you fall into a sleep state, to get all the real benefits from the deeper stages of sleep, which is only about 20% in any sleep period, so they're difficult to get. And to get them, your brain's got to go through a really nice process. But if you're constantly you know, processing fluids into your bladder that builds and builds and builds to the point that you get woken up, and then you have to go to the toilet and start again, then in that eight hours or whatever you think you slept last night, you might have got about 5% good sleep. So the rest of it was a complete waste of time. So if I could show you 
that over a period of a very short period of time, what happens with recovery is, is that you think you're your personal best. You think you're at your peak, and you may well be as an individual or an athlete. But if you're not getting the right levels of recovery, what you are is literally a shadow of your former self. And because it's just a very slow process, you don't spot it. And if you sort of put somebody in front of that lovely reaction, Katya, and you just deprive them a little bit from recovery, and suddenly they miss that one down. But then you do it and they get it. Suddenly they start to become aware that at this moment in time, they think they're at their peak. They think they're at their personal best. But if they approach this and redefine it a little bit, what they'll do is they'll start to feel that they're a few steps ahead of themselves now and not behind it. And that's when you start to see that marginal gain with, you know, the th half the thickness of my finger is a gold medal on a sprint on a track. And, and it's those tiny little things that you've just been able to, to put some more color into that person, to put some, everything that they're doing is quite right. And I think if you ask them a question, which is one of my, you know, seven key sleep recovery questions, is if I ask you, Ben, could you just tell me a little bit about the circadian rhythms of the day? And they normally look at me and go, I think I know what they are. I said, okay. How do they impact on how you plan your day? They don't, because you don't know really much of answer. Okay. What's your chronotype then? What's a chronotype? Well, are you a morning person or a nighttime person? Because it's genetic. We have the tech now. It used to be owls and larks a few decades ago because we just classified people as owls and larks. But we didn't really know why. But now we know it's genetic. So some people within the natural circadian rhythms of the day are about two strokes, three hours behind others because they've got that chronotype that determines they are a pm -er, a nighttime person, not an am -er. So suddenly, if you're, whatever you're doing in life, if you get a better awareness of circadian rhythms, of the chronotype, suddenly you're able to you're able to make sure that you can do things at the right times of the day that's the right way for you and your Um And that's something that people, you know, they start to get really intrigued. They start to get more interested. They start to see that a lot of things that they are doing, I wouldn't advise them to do it. And it also helps, Ben, and over the years, is that, Obviously, if I'm doing this with Real Madrid or British Cycling or the RFL or the RFU and sending sleep kits out to Rio, there's one in a box right behind me there, then obviously what I'm doing must be working and it must be helping. And I think most athletes today and most people today would rather like to make sure that they live a long life and when you point out that what they do in those formative years, right up you know, into their early 20s, is as they approach their occupations, their sports, and they stay tight, start to take over their lives and determine what they're doing, and like you said before, suddenly children come along maybe, is that your ability to manage your recovery as well as how you fuel up and hydrate up um, is going to be quite key to a lot of things as you move on into your later career. And, you know, people like Ryan Giggs can put his boots on tomorrow and play for most squads anywhere <laughs> without a second thought. You know, so would David Beckham. You know, they're not, they're not, uh, they're not wandering around with Zimmer frames. They're just not playing because it, it's just a bit ridiculous to be playing at that age. <laughs> um, that's all it is. You know, make room for the kids. But, you know, once you start to put it in that context that everything you want to do will be determined on how well you've recovered. Every decision you take, your alertness, your reaction times, the decisions, memory, retention of information, the ability to act 
act in a certain way. Your ability to listen and not always shout your mouth off. Your ability to, to just go, I use this device to wake myself up in the morning, but what I don't do is read all those notifications. Before I've emptied my bladder, I've had something to eat, drink, I've got some daylight into my body to get me from a sleep state into a proper wake state. I've done a little bit of exercise, even if that's just walking the dog around the field, because I'm getting daylight. I'm also getting a little bit of exercise. I've ironed a shirt. Uh, it was just a little simple mental task, just as a post-sleep routine, bring me to the end. So then I get up my tech and I read all my notifications and emails and go, not interested, not interested, that's funny, yes. That was all right, yeah. Oh, the boss is after me. Oh, somebody's died. Ah, yeah, okay, that's fine. I'm happy. If I do that, hit the alarm in the morning, and I start reading these notifications, I can react to them. And it's a little bit like texting when you're drunk. Don't do it. Just don't do it, right? Because... It's amazing. Yeah, so when you start to observe recovery factors, you know, play, players, athletes, they suddenly start to realize that even just one little significant thing like that is if you get some structure into what you're doing and you just be aware that there's nothing wrong with this, there's nothing wrong with it in the slightest, and it's going to get more and we're going to embrace it. But how do you work with it? How do you understand that you're a human being? This is tech. Now, you're in control of that, not that in control of you. And, you know, particularly with young athletes, when they start retweeting and stuff like that, suddenly they go, oh, no, what did I do? They regret it an hour later. Um, so there's lots of little things you start to get into somebody's head. And uh, even... You know, not it's not for everybody, Ben, and uh, but I can I can assure you that wherever you look across the the planet at this moment in time, there are some pretty serious issues coming through where our next sports people are. Mm. They're in that educational process. They're routines. They're gamers. They're techies. They don't see the light of day. They're not interested in sports. You know, this is where the athletes come from in the main, you know, and and it's a, and that's where our workforce comes from. And there's some serious issues down there as to how the next generation is going to be. And, uh, you know, even even within the business world, it's a, it's, a, it's a big subject. But what you have to do is forget about sleep. But you just forget it. It's, it's, it's like we hoover the carpet, which is a manufacturer's name for a vacuum cleaner. You know, certain things just hang around. And they don't describe on what we're trying to do with it. So if you sleep, it means you sleep on the sofa, on the floor, on a train, on a plane. On, you know, you can sleep anywhere, camping, on a bit of foam, up the side of a mountain, hanging off it as a cliff, as a climber. You can sleep under a tree, you know, in a hot country, you know, in ice up in the North and South Pole. You can sleep anywhere. You just get to a point where your body needs to recover, you go into a sleep state, you'll come out of it and crack on and go and get your food and get your, and get on with your day. But in a lot of areas, you know, you've just got to forget about that. So, you know, there is a, a technique that I've developed. It's, it's to help people cope with it, you know, that's more relevant for today's, because we wouldn't have all these issues and you wouldn't be talking to me now if the academic and clinical world, which provide us with all the information we want and all the support of how important this whole process is. And yet we choose to work shifts, work nights, play games at 11 o'clock at night, travel from India to Yorkshire overnight and play, you know, we, we do all sorts of that, completely ignoring the fact that we should do certain things in a certain way. So it's like redefining your own approach to sleep and making it work for you. Nick, um, this has been very fascinating. And as you've been talking, I've written down like another 12, maybe 15 questions to ask you from what I've already <laughs> asked you, which I think was two questions so far. 
Um, I have to I have to end the show here because there's a second appointment that I've got at twelve o'clock. Um, there's loads more I want to be able to ask you. Would you be willing to do a part two of this podcast? Absolutely, because there are you know it's a bit of um, I think initially to get people's interest you have to sort of you know like we've been doing today have a chat with it you know but then they want to know where are the takeaways what can I do you know how can I do that. And there's some great devices out there and some really bad ones. There's some good stuff coming around and there's some stuff you need to avoid. Um, there's some simple techniques that could literally change your life and your approach to it. And I think, you know, if that was an opportunity to come back and tell your listeners about those specific things, no problem at all. That would be amazing because um, I want everyone to research more of your work as well. So we're going to leave it for today. You and me will communicate. We'll set up part two. Um, if people want to go and check out your work right now because they're intrigued, where are the links, Facebook, website, that kind of stuff where they can go and have a look? The, the best place to go, it's, it's very simple if you just think of the word sport, not sports, but sport, sleep, coach. So it's sportsleepcoach.com. If you go there, uh, there's loads of blogs, there's loads of stuff, uh, there's coaching services, there's products that we design for athletes, but anybody can buy them. Uh, and also, you know, at Sports League Coaches, the Twitter handle. There's a Facebook site there, but, you know, we've got, um, we've got some pretty serious followers around the world who, you know, we communicate as their sleep advisors, um, you know, across everything, every field of sleep. So it's, um, if they go there, they can find lots of information. They can, they can get in touch if they want, you know, we don't have any barriers to you know, the mobile phone is, for the company is mine, so if you ring it, I'll answer it. Um, if you email nick at sportsleepcoach.com, you know, I'm consulting with doctors, professional athletes, kids, all over the world. So, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things, they definitely want to listen to your next podcast on this. Um, and... They would be quite amazed at how much it can change, how they feel every day, and pretty much don't waste valuable time sleeping without benefits. Get it under control, and you'll be a much better person. Nice. Well, there you have it, everyone. We're going to do part two. When that happens, we'll see. I'll try and get these episodes back to back so you can uh, maintain that excitement. Please go to sports, sport coach, sport. <laughs> <laughs> sportsleepcoach.com sport, sleep, and also Just think look, of sleep coach and then put sport in front yeah, of it yeah sportsleepcoach.com look that up on Twitter as I always ask tag us both in Twitter uh, maybe ask us a question maybe ask a question for part two if I haven't recorded it already uh, get involved in the conversation and you can check out uh, Nick and the work that he does there um, Nick thanks again for being on the show no problem man uh, and I will speak to you all on the next episode. Ciao. Welcome to the first ever Ask SFN show. Uh, this is a show where we bring the biggest names in sport, fitness and nutrition to the couch.